tonight we are here to learn about uh, 5G and wireless radiation from Dr. Kent Chamberlain, so welcome. Thank you. Um, so Dr. Chamberlain received his PhD from Ohio University and he specialized in computational electromagnetics. His research has been devoted to modeling radio wave propagation including interfering radiation from computing devices and wave phenomena in the human body. He was appointed by UNH to serve on a New Hampshire commission to investigate the health and environmental impacts of wireless radiation. And tonight he's going to be sharing with us an overview of that commission's activities and findings. And we do have Berwick Community Media here filming tonight's presentation, so you can watch this later. Um, it will be on our website as well as on um, Berwick Community Media's YouTube page. And we'll also include uh, Dr. Chamberlain's uh, presentation slides as well. Um, so you will have access to those. So welcome, Dr. Chamberlain. I'm going to pass it on to you. So you. Oh. Thank you so much. I should mention I had a COVID test this morning, and it turned out negative. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you've all been hearing gloom and doom stuff. We know COVID, you're wearing masks. And I'm not going to necessarily add to that by talking about the concerns, the hazards associated with exposure to radiation. But I am going to let you know that there, uh, what those concerns, what those risks are so that you can avoid them. One of the problems is that we really haven't acknowledged what's going on with wireless, with exposure to wireless at this point, so we haven't been able to do anything about it. And I'll explain to you why that is, why you haven't heard about this before, because you'd think that, gosh, you know, with this being a danger, we would have at least heard about it. But I'll explain why you haven't. And that's one thing that I'm doing, and, and I should note, and this is kind of a conflict of interest statement, that I'm doing this, I'm going around to various venues like this, presenting very similar presentation to the one I'm going to give you tonight, not for money, but because I think it's important that people know about that. You know, once you understand a risk, you can avoid it. But until you do, that you're probably going to be doing some things that aren't in your best interest. So conflict of interest, I am not getting paid for this, and, and I feel it's important to say that because if you hear from people from the telecommunications industry, and you might, they'll come in, give a similar presentation, or they'll try to refute what I'm saying tonight, they'll tell you that exposure to fields is absolutely harmless. And we'll, you know, I'll explain why they're making that claim, because there's a huge amount of money involved, as I think you, you can recognize. But not gloom and doom. Let's understand the problem, let's understand what's going on, and, and I'll try to make a lot of time available so that we can talk about your specific questions if you have them, if I'm not addressing them in my presentation. So what I will be covering will be, first of all, the New Hampshire Commission. I'm not here presenting my opinion about radiation. I served on a commission, I'll talk briefly about what that commission was, and we, the commission, comprised of experts, came to some conclusions, and that's what I'll be sharing with you tonight. And then I'll get into some fundamental concepts. And this is where I want to open it up to questions. This is a small group. So if I'm going through something and, and things aren't quite clicking and you have questions, feel free to just shout out your questions. So I'll go over some of those fundamental concepts, fundamental questions that you might have. And then go over into an overview of, well, this is kind of the boring part. I'll try to go quickly through that. But where did we, how come we came to the conclusions we came to? What was the information that we went through that made us say, these are risky? So I'll, I'll talk about that briefly because you need to know. It's not just something, an opinion, it's not something that we just felt was the case. We, we based our uh, conclusions on rigorous scientific studies. Then finally, the politi political and financial driving points. You know, like, why haven't you heard about this before? What's driving this? What are the financial pressures that are making our concerns about wireless not being heard? So having said that, let's go to the commission on 5G. And so I, here I was uh, minding my own business as the chair of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering in, at the University of New Hampshire. And I get a call from the chancellor's office asking if I would serve on a commission. So that's what I'm talking to you about now, but let's give you a little bit of a timeline. I think it's interesting that this all started, this, the, the commission itself started back in 2018 when a person living in uh, uh, Stratford, or, I'm sorry, Stratum, New Hampshire, uh, was electrosensitive. I'm not, I, can, I can answer questions about electrosensitivity, but basically 
a person with electrosensitivity can't be in the same room with a working cell phone. Otherwise, they start getting, you know, irritated. Do they get rashes? They get just very unpleasant things happen. But anyhow, this woman that had electrosensitivity was concerned about the rollout of new towers in her area, so she wanted to do something about it. And so she started looking around, contacting people to find out what she as a citizen could do to stop towers from being put in her backyard. And, and I suspect some of you may have the same concerns because it can happen almost anywhere. So anyhow, she reached out and I'm uh, going to make these slides available. And I'm putting in hyperlinks here. So if there's anything I say that you want to know about, you simply go to my slides and click on, in this case, CC Doucette. She, if you have concerns and you want to do something about wireless, she's a very good contact because she's the one that put this uh, person from Stratham, New Hampshire, in contact with a lot of people. And uh, I'm not going to dwell on this, but this is, uh, she started contacting legislators. She started trying to have uh, a group get-togethers to talk about wireless and the concerns and didn't get much traction until finally she reached out to uh, the right politician. And I'm saying this story because some of you may have been in a similar circumstance. You, you've got a concern, a concern that could be solved politically. What do you do about it? Well, she finally reached out to the, and found the right politician, and, and this guy uh, in particular was, is named Pat Abrami. He's a representative in New Hampshire, and he was willing to take on her concerns, her cause for wireless. Now, this is not a sexy issue for a politician. Sexy issues are ones that are going to move forward, build jobs and all that, but when you're talking about the safety of your constituents, that's kind of like, that's not easy. It's not an easy sell. But this guy took it on, learned about the concerns, the hazards, the dangers of exposure to electromagnetic field, and came up with a, a bill. And that bill is to form a commission. So we got some politicians together. They said, yes, you've got a legitimate concern. Let's form a commission to study this in depth. And so uh, they, the, the bill, and it's linked here also if you want to see what that bill looked like that the legislature voted on, to form a commission, uh, that legislation it, uh, was passed by with bipartisan support, so it had to go through both houses of the legislature, and it was signed by the governor and came active in 2019, in July. Uh, what's important here is this is the first bill of its type, the first commission formed of its type in the United States to look at the issues of 5G and of wireless radiation. And again, when you think about it, think about how long cell phones have been around, that's kind of a concern. Why did it take so long for us to get to this point? And part of the reason is that it's not a sexy issue. It's not an issue that politicians would want to pursue, but we just happen to find a particularly brave and heroic politician. Uh, <laughs> that's rare, right? <laughs> so some of the questions that were posed, so a six-page uh, bill to form this commission, and some of the questions, which may be questions that you came in asking yourself, and I hope to, and I will be able to answer them, I hope, and that is why do, does insurance industry, why does it recognize wireless radiation as a risk, but it won't insure against it? Even Lloyd's of London will not insure against radiation cause, or dangers or, or injury caused by cell phone radiation. So that was one. Uh, why are the thousands of peer-reviewed studies showing harm from radiation, why are they being completely ignored by the Federal Communications Commission? And I'll talk more about that in a moment. So, you know, the Federal Communications Commission, they're the ones that are supposed to protect us against radiation. And then why are FCC guidelines based solely on thermal effects? Thermal effects. Your microwave oven is an example of a thermal effect. You put food in, you turn it on, it gives lots of radiation, it warms up your food. The FCC, up till now, and including now, says that's the only risk you have to worry about, is warming your cells up. But we're finding, we on the commission found something quite different, and that is non-thermal. In other words, the non-warming radiation is also of great concern and causes, causes risks. And then why did the health, uh, World Health Organization, they labeled radiation to be a class B carcinogen. Why was that being, why is that being completely ignored by the FCC, Federal Communications Commission? So those are the questions. Uh, we also, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this, the, the bill was very thorough in specifying who had to be on the commission. 
Uh, and because I, I had no experience with a commission, a state commission before, I assumed that maybe the government governor would say, oh, I want to you know, look into this, and they would appoint people. In, in this case, the legislation was very clear about who had to be, what expertise had to be represented on the commission. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but I do want to mention that we had our backgrounds on the commission, including physics, you can read it here, toxicology, electromagnetics, epidemiology, biostatistics, occupational health, medicine, we had two physicians on, the, on this commission. So we had the necessary expertise to look at this issue and really draw conclusions that would be accepted by people because of the expertise on the commission. Now, I was brought in because of my background in electromagnetics. Uh, but other people were brought in for very different reasons. But in the final analysis, we had thir 13 members of the commission, all with expertise that would allow us and did allow us to look at the problems that we were, we were asked to look at. So the timeline, I won't spend long on this. It was uh, a year that we met, uh, met a good number of times, uh, and we met with expertise. It's uh, experts fr from around the field. Um, and in particular, well, you can see it here, we, had, uh, we met 13 times, and we met with nine experts from all around the country, in fact, around the world, who had experience with the dangers posed by electromagnetic fields. So we would bring these people into our meetings. Sometimes we brought them in via Zoom, but these are people from all over the world and ask them about radiation and what the effects were. So, um, actually, yeah. Then we formed a subgroup. Oh, I'm sorry. Hearing okay? Okay. We formed a subgroup uh, to write the final report, and the final report is linked to these slides. So if you want to look at the report, I should caution you that it's a 390-page report, but only about 10 pages. Most of it is appendix, but most, of, but uh, 10 pages of it really describes oh. what our findings were. I'm going to go through those very briefly right now, so I'm not going to dwell too long on that. Uh, so you have the final report, click on the link if you get my slides and you can look at that final report. So the experts who presented, I'm just providing a list of those experts just for documentation so you have it right here. And if you want more information, I'm easy to find, you can easily or I welcome you to send me an email if there's anything that I have here on my slides that you'd like to follow up with, such as who presented to the commission and what do they tell you. So the sources of information uh, for the findings, we, we brought in those outside experts, as I just mentioned. And I want to note here that all of the presenters except one provided clear evidence that wireless radiation poses a threat to human health and the environment. All experts but one. And that one expert who said that there was no harm associated with radiation exposure was the only paid expert that came to talk with us. In other words, all of the experts we brought in volunteered their time, like I'm volunteering my time tonight, except for that one paid expert. And he came in and said, oh, there's no harm. So who was paying him? The telecommunications industry, in particular the CTIA, Cellular Telecommunications Industries Association. And so they're a big group. I'll talk more about them later, but they have lots and lots of money. I mean, a little bit of your money that you pay to, to the cell phone companies goes to them every month. So they've got lots and lots of money, so they can pay these guys to come in and say, I mean, it... it thank you for saying that, yes. <laughs> and I just, I, I, it affects my, uh, my belief in humanity to see people who know better go up there and simply say, there is no harm. Some of you may have heard them, if for anybody that was watching what was going on in York, Maine. They brought these guys in, and they just said, absolutely no harm. I'll say more about that later. But then peer-reviewed publications. I'll talk a little bit about, I, I know this is kind of the boring part, to talk about peer-reviewed publications that document the, the harm caused by radiation, but you do need to hear it, because that's how we came up with our conclusions. Not opinions, but hard science. So our conclusions? No surprise here, wireless radiation, including 5G. In fact, here's something I need to say, and that is wireless radiation. We get it from a lot of different sources. We have it from our cell phones, obviously, from cell towers. It's the same basic radiation. 5G is in that, that whole that area also. Um, baby monitors. Uh, come on, what are other digital devices you have? You know, cordless phones. Which one? Smart meters. 
smart meters uh, smart meters is a big one because they're going they're fairly powerful and they're radiating pretty much 24 7 information i don't think we need so all of this radiation is in the same category and all of it causes harm so it's not like 5g is particularly worse it may be worse we don't have enough information right that now to say it but it does cause harm as does regular your 4g 3g uh, cell phone so that's a finding. It's pretty clear and unambiguous. Uh, this is not a scientific issue for reasons that I've kind of referred to a few times. It's a, it's a political issue. Yeah. There's a lot, a lot of money involved. And I'll explain a little bit about where that money, why that money is, where it, you know, it comes into play. So our general recommendations, we need to reevaluate our radiation standards. The FCC standards have been in place that is, the limits on radiation exposure have been in place since 1996. Do you think much has changed in terms of the electromagnetic environment since 1996? I didn't have a cell phone in 1996. So lots have changed, but the rules have not. And right now the standards are so high that a cell tower cannot violate those limits once you get a few meters away from the site. So it's like having a speed limit of 500 miles an hour on 95. You can't exceed it. So the FCC or the telecom providers, they never have to worry about exceeding their limits. They can't. So, but that is, we wanted to come up with more realistic guidelines and progress is being made in that arena, albeit in that arena, albeit slowly. Tech, oh, yeah. When you have Wi-Fi in schools, which yes. theoretically is better than just wireless at least you've got it to the school wired maybe and then you have wi-fi but in a, or a school a building something that uses a lot of laptops and technology they can't exceed the with all those devices they won't be exceeding the limit either absolutely right the limit is ridiculous and i i'll, I'll show that with, with slides you're absolutely right you can't with all the cell phones you know that you might have on the it's like pollution you if you have your cell phones on it all adds up so if you have 10 people in a room with their cell phones turned on you got a certain level of communicate of, of pollution electro pollution and if you double that number with cell phones you're going to double the pollution and so but you're still going to be substantially below the FCC limit and I have examples of that so that's a good question yes yeah I, I'm sorry I came in late so oh, you said this. okay um, what is that FCC limit uh, 10 um, 10 watts per meter squared okay. which to me is like uh, I mean remember this is my field electromagnetics mm -hmm. and so when you talk about power densities that high I kind of like whoa yes sir well, uh, the they Chris said. Uh, well, actually, it, but the thing is, we are we've been accustomed to exposure to the visible light, so that's why we can go out in the sun where we're getting far greater exposure, but we're not conditioned to electromagnetic radiation at the lower frequencies. But I agree, in the visible spectrum, lights you're getting right now, it's higher than the 10 watt. Actually, I'm not. No, that's not the case. It's not, it's not 10 watts per meter squared. Consider it, you have a bulb, a 10 watt bulb. You move out and so you take that 10 divided by four pi r squared and so it's going to be dropping off really quickly. So no, this is lower than the FCC limit. But like I say, we, our bodies, are used to visible light. We've had it for you know, hundreds of thousands of years, but we're not used to this new radiation. How long has radiation been around, like radio wave uh, radiation? A mm -hmm. uh, hundred years? Not really. I mean, it hasn't been all that strong. So this is new to us, and we are not prepared. We biologically are not prepared to deal with it, and bad things happen when we're exposed to it. And I'll show you examples of that coming up. So we decided we needed to, in the committee, oh, yeah. We needed to alert the public. And so, because I was near retirement, <laughs> who got pointed to to go tell the public about the concerns <laughs> and the, the hazards of radiation? There is no such thing as retirement, I'm convinced of that. <laughs> but we want to get the word out, let people know, because once people know, uh, you know, I've had this happen so many times, I tell people that didn't know about the, the risks, and they look at me and they say, well, yeah, I always thought 
there would be a risk mm -hmm. with something that is new like this, something that our bodies aren't used to being exposed to. So that's one thing we're going to do. We also want to work with schools to become wired, and I have a slide on this uh, in a little bit, because if you wire your house, ours was already wired, so we wired it when the Ethernet first came out, and then we went to wireless later on, but once I found out about the, con the, the risks of exposure, I went back to wired again, and my God, it is so fast, I don't know if you've ever gone from wireless to wired network. Files, I can, I can download huge files. And also there's a security issue that isn't really talked about very much. But when you are on a wireless network, it's pretty darn easy for people to tap in to your, your entire network mm -hmm. in your home. Mm -hmm. But when you're wired, that's not, not a risk. Yes? Um, yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, you, sometimes you have to look at situations like yours on a case-by-case -case basis. But if we're looking at your neighbor's Wi-Fi, it's going to be at a much lower power level than yours. And, and for a lot of what we're talking about, you simply want to lower your radiation levels. And there's a lot you can do. So going wired yourself so that you're not radiating within your own home will make a significant difference. And then I would recommend, and, and in some states they've done this now, they make meters available in public libraries. So you can go in, check out a meter, look at the radiation levels in your home, and then you might you, you be surprised that some things that you buy have Internet of Things devices in them that are radiating and you don't even know about it. So you can identify those. You know, you buy printers nowadays. They're wireless. And so, the, but you can, and TVs. So you might go into your home with a meter, you have turned everything down that you know to turn down, and all of a sudden you're seeing sources of radiation, identify them, and there are ways of turning off the, the, the radiation sources. Uh, encourage <laughs> mitigation to, to where you're going. Oh, and particularly for schools, this is something else that's huge, and that is children are much more susceptible to radiation than we are. Skulls are thinner, and I'm thinking young children. Yet they have devices that you can put cell phones in so the kids can play with it. Mm -hmm. That is, is really, really bad. Um, and in schools, you know, a lot of us were involved, me included, in getting technology into the classroom, only to find out that this same technology is causing harm to our students. And I'll talk more about that, too, with some of the studies. And then uh, one of our uh, recommendations, one that we're putting into legislation right now is to put a 500 meter or 1,640 foot offset between where you can put a cell tower and where people live, recreate, and work. And that will go a long way. So if we're able to get that legislation passed, that will go a long way to protecting people. Because the way it's written, the laws are written right now, they can put a tower in your backyard and there's not much you can do and so we're trying to change that. I'll tell you, this is a, I'll say a little bit more about this, but it pr no, it probably wouldn't be. And so it's, we're, we're expecting a political fight on this, but we're gonna do our best. The legislation's written, it's passed our legal analysts. In other words, they say, yeah, you're, you're, you're free now to vote on this, but the voting's not gonna happen until the fall of next year, 2022. But we're ready. It's the legislation's in good form to vote. It's ready for, for being voted on, and now we need to do the, the politicking and educate the legislators. So no matter what state you're from, I'm obviously New Hampshire, get your legislators involved and let them understand the problems. There's a lot of money pushing against what we're trying to push for. And so, yes? Exactly. So to get your local rep to, you know, sign on to that bill that she's working on going forward is a big thing. Yeah, and, right and yeah, and to, to really say to your rep, have you heard about it? 
wanted. Yeah, and she, she came to my last or to my presentation in York, yes, and we had a good conversation afterwards, and it sounds like she is planning to do something. And I've been contacted by legislators in Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, uh, Idaho, California, so there are things going on. A lot of other people are taking seriously what we've done right here, and they're taking our conclusions seriously as well. So our next steps, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, sir. The question of cell towers. I want to just yes. That a little. Um, you made a statement that said, well, they can just come in and put a cell tower up anywhere. Now, I've got 35 acres. Can they come put a cell tower up in my 35 acres? No, not on your private property, right next to okay. it. Okay. Yeah, and next, next to it, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, so I, I am <laughs> well, misstated myself. Here, right. Apples are up too. Yeah, okay. Although I've heard that, that, well, I actually I don't want to go into what I heard. I want to be really careful here. But they can, in public right-of-ways, they can put towers. My son sent me a picture the other day. Fortunately, he was from an apartment that he was about to move out of. And he said, Dad, this is a new antenna. What, what is it? And it was a 5G antenna right looking into his bedroom window. So this can happen. And I've had panicked yeah. calls from people around the country where this has happened to them. So there's a lot that... Uh, happening outside of uh, Concord. It, it, yeah, and they're rolling them out rather quickly. Okay. So, of yeah, well, of yeah. well, because people are getting wise, and so yeah. they want to get them rolled out yeah. because it probably won't be grandfathered any legislative changes that we make. Mm -hmm. So they want to get them in now before people get the right legislation yeah. in place. Yeah. yeah. So. It's very <laughs> interesting because the the political machine moves slowly for the vote, the ordinance, the vote for this, but meanwhile. Absolutely. The, the technology, you know, they're pushing it as quickly as they can. They sure are. Absolutely. But these next steps, just like I mentioned, uh, we got the legislation. It's already written. We're ready to to get vote on it, but that won't happen until next fall. Talk about slow. Remember, this problem was identified back in the winter of 2018, mm -hmm. getting the uh, commission together and getting the, they have the commission do its work and then finally vote on it four years later. Mm -hmm. uh, we're expecting an uphill battle. And this is where you guys come in, you talk to your legislators, let them know what's going on. I will give uh, you know, presentations to them. I'll keep giving presentations until we get people more knowledgeable about the risks involved. So uh, to answer some just basic questions that you may have uh, and questions that you probably haven't heard answered in the press are questions like this. What happens when people are exposed to strong wireless radiation, but radiation that is way below the FCC limit? And let's look at a case here. This comes from California. This is well documented. And again, this is one of those cases where you look at what I'm about to say and you say, how is it that we, that this, something this profound could happen and we wouldn't know about it? And that is because, think about it. You'd hear about it from the media, right? But who advertises a lot in the media? telecommunications industry. So media are going to be really careful in advertising or in reporting something that makes them look bad, makes the advertisers look bad. Also, where are you hearing this from tonight? You're hearing it from somebody who is fortunate enough to be able to give presentations like this. I'm retired and I can afford to do this. Most people can't. So this is a, a somewhat rare opportunity. So let's answer this question right here. What happened when the cell towers were turned on? So this is California. Somebody thought it would be a great idea, it would be a money-saving idea, to put towers, cell towers, near the, uh, the fire stations where the firefighters live and sleep for periods of time and then, you know, go home. So you put the towers there, great location for them, right? And, and then you turn the towers on. So what happened? This is worth reading. Within a week of installation, many firefighters developed unusual symptoms of headaches, fatigue, insomnia, memory loss, confusion, nausea, and weakness. After a time, firefighters in stations with adjacent cell towers were found to have forgotten CPR or became lost responding to fires in a city where they grew up. Hmm. Now here's what's a little bit insidious about this. Not a little bit insidious, a lot insidious about re the, some of the symptoms of radiation exposure. If you look at these symptoms, is that something about just getting older? Maybe I'm just having a bad day. Maybe I drank too much last night. Now in cases where this is easily identified and related to exposure to electromagnetic fields is in cases where you have people grouped together. 
So these firefighters, they get up and they go, oh, I feel terrible, and they compared notes and found out the other firefighters were experiencing the same thing. And then they could work back, well, what is different about today than, you know, than yesterday? And the answer is they turned on the cell tower. And so I'm seeing this in a number of locations around the country, including Pittsfield, Massachusetts, maybe some of you have heard about it. It's really sad because I'm, I'm learning to know these, getting to know these people. They, they put in a cell tower in a neighborhood. Actually, they put it in the wrong place, but that's another thing that's about permitting. permitting. And the, the tower was there for quite a while. Nobody thought anything about it. Nothing was happening. And then one day, a bunch of the neighbors, 14 to be exact, started getting sick, getting some of these symptoms right here. And they started talking to each other, and then they called Verizon, said, well, did you turn the tower on? Yeah, we turned it on yesterday. So things that you might think are just a matter of being alive, insomnia, we all get that from time to time, can be caused by cell phone or, or cell tower and just wireless radiation in general. Be aware of this, and, and so um, in your own life, there are things that you can do, and in fact, uh, I'm, uh, one suggestion for you is turn, just start turning off your electronics at night. Turn, I definitely, you know, put your cell phone in, in airplane mode, turn off your Wi-Fi, put it on a timer. I know a lot of people are doing that. And I've been telling groups like you that, and, and some people have gotten back to me, they said, it's, it's amazing. Now, there's a placebo effect, perhaps, but uh, a good, enough people have gotten back to me to convince me that this is real, Turn your electronics off, lower your exposure at night, and you'll probably be sleeping better. There are tests, by the way. Uh, electro, uh, electromagnetic hypersensitivity is a real thing. It's recognized by Medicare and the ADA. It's real. I could actually spend a, a lot more time talking about that. So it's real, and there are tests that you can perform to find out if the symptoms like this that you're getting are as a result of exposure to chemicals or electromagnetic, so they can be tested, it is real, and more and more physicians are becoming trained on how to identify this issue. So, um, what's the incentive? Here's something again, you know, I just showed you some horrible thing that can happen from radiation exposure. And so, your question by would be, well, what would make it worth it? to expose people to that degree of radiation and cause harm. Why would you do that? And one example, uh, one reason is just, it's, it boils down to money, you're not surprised to hear that. But wouldn't you have a different, don't you, you probably will have a different relationship with this device once you know that it can cause harm. And so you'll start working it, using it differently, and I hope you do, and that's one thing that I've learned. So it'll change the rela people's relationships with their electronic devices. And also, if you are allowed to radiate huge amounts of, of radiation, let's say the, you know, the 10 watts per meter squared, that will allow you to put cell towers in populated areas. You'll get a great coverage area, and, but the problem is you, you'll be radiating uh, people near the towers at very high levels. In fact, let's take a look at an example of this. This is where I, I was involved. This is Lenox, Massachusetts. And they wanted to put a cell tower or cell tower antennas on top of a historic building that housed the elderly and disabled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to me, this is, I mean, of course, they could say, they could look at the symptoms that would be created by that and say, oh, no, it's just, they're old, they're disabled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, perfect that, yeah, yeah, perfect cover, yeah. exactly. And so yeah. I became involved in this. And what you can see there is a top view and in the center of that circle is the, the place where they want to locate the, uh, the cell tower, the antennas. So the, it, it, the one reason this is so desirable for them is that notice you already have roads in place, you have utilities that are there. So they could go in, put in the antennas, turn the thing on, turn up the power, and they'd get a great coverage area, and they would be exposing <laughs> people near it to a very high level. Note the radius of that circle is 500 meters or 1,640 feet. That's the area that we're saying, no, you should have nobody in that region to, to do this in a way that's not going to harm people. Yes, sir? How far from the center of that did that drop off to 10 meters, 10 watts per meter square? I mean, at 500 meters, assuming it was at 10 meters. No, so it's, it's roughly 2 meters for a typical tower. At 2 meters, you're at 10 watts per meter square. Okay, so you take 250 and square that. 
No, no. The energy density at the outer, outer edge. No, yes. <laughs> sir. <laughs> one over r squared. It is one over squared. Twenty log r. I'm there. Yeah. I've done all these calculations, and I want to. We can talk numbers if you'd like to. The bottom line is you're getting a booming signal. Uh, now, something that is important here is that the to get a robust uh, cell phone signal, uh, talk four or five bars. We are talking a power of one billionth of the power density that you'd be getting here. So in other words, you do not need to have the high power. You'd still get great cell phone coverage if you move the tower away. And so here's an example, uh, taking a look at basically the same map, but now putting in tower over right here. So if you put a tower here, a tall tower, and I am recommending tall towers, and then beamed into this direction right here, you'd still have your well over 500 meter separation distance, but you'd have substantially lower radiation for the people living in Lennox Mass. They would be relatively safe. And I say relatively because, relatively, because people who have electromagnetic hypersensitivity would still get, be sensitive to and have an adverse reaction being 500 meters from a cell tower. So I can run the numbers out for you. It'd probably you know, it'd be boring. But this is the conclusion that the, cell, that the commission came to. So it's not anybody's opinion. And I'll back it up in just a moment with some real hard data. Yeah. So, oh, and the reason that this is expensive is that now if you put, you know, just to locate a place like here, you have to rent it from somebody, maybe 35 acres, but you'd probably have a different answer for them. I would. They have to run access roads. And that's not cheap. You have to run utilities. So to go from this one right here, where you're located in the center of a town, to something that is safe, we're talking a difference in hundreds of thousands of dollars. So when you look at the number of cell towers and you multiply that hundreds of thousands of dollars times the number of cell towers, we're talking about huge amounts of money. So that's why they would like to, to keep the radiation threshold so high, the 10 watts per meter squared. Yes? I'm glad you raised that issue. That's right, because that's even cheaper for them than yeah. building a tall cell tower. And that's they right. They radiate us really well every other telephone call. Mm. That's right. And, and, and that's why in our legislation, we're not making a distinction between the 5G and the f 3 and 4G towers. We're saying that, no, you have to be far away from the 5G towers also. So, so the 3G, the 4G, and the 5, you're saying they're the same? Actually, I'm, it's, it's maybe time to make an important distinction. Yeah. You know, what we're using right now is 3 and 4G yes. mostly. And so some people are saying, oh, when 5G comes along, does 3 and 4G go away? And the answer is no, it doesn't go away. 5G piggybacks on 3G and 4G. And, and what it does is it actually increases our radiation load because you're adding something and you're not taking anything away. Right. So it, it's better than to at least stay with 3G? Um, my personal belief would be that uh, 3 and 4G, I mean, I'm able okay. to do everything I need. You know, I don't need to do visual, okay. virtual reality out in the middle of a field somewhere. So, but that's my personal belief. And so right now, I'm uh, just <laughs> actually trying to stay away from my personal beliefs, but the yeah. findings of the commission. Yeah. So the commission really didn't weigh in on that. They simply acknowledge the 5G adds on to 3 and 4G and adds to your overall right. radiation load. Right. Okay. Aren't they getting rid of 3G? Like no. 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 2G. Or oh, 2G may be going away, but basically 5G adds on to 3 and 4G. Why is everybody I've, I've seen ads about that, though. I've seen That's things right. about the 3G is going to disappear, nobody's oh. going to have it anymore. Have to get new 5G phones. No, that's well, <laughs> well, and and here's something else. There is no clearly defined 5G. It's it's a marketing tool. That there's no way that they specify. You know, there are regulations about Wi-Fi as an example. But with 5G, you can do it. However, companies have pretty much carte blanche to do it as they want whatever frequencies they want. And some companies are using the same frequencies for what they call 5G as they used for 3 and 4G. I know, I, we found that a little bit confusing too. Yeah, that's <laughs> the point. <laughs> it's 
but the, yeah. actually, I, I'd rather not get into that now, okay, yeah, but, no, but just, just what are the risks? Yeah. And, and here's uh, to answer some of the questions, and actually, sir, you were asking about the 500 meters, and I'm, I'm going to address that head on here. So what is an appropriate setback distance, and where did you guys come up with the 500 meters, that is the 1,640 feet? And in particular, um, you know, why did, we, why did we choose it, and how do you determine what is an appropriate setback distance? So a study that I'm going to refer to, it's a little, can I just read that all right? So there are a number of studies, in particular there are 10 studies that look at the epidemiology of people living near cell towers. And eight of those 10 studies show similar trends to what I'm about to show you right here. This particular one was done quite a few years ago, between 1996 and 2006. And what's significant about that, and what I, I think it's important in what I'm about to explain, is because back in that time period, in Brazil, not a lot of people had their own cell phones. So the effect that we're going to be looking at on the next slide is a factor, uh, or the effect of living near a cell tower or being farther from a cell tower. This is not a small study, you know, oh yeah, you did onesies and twosies. No, this is over 840 towers, 856 t cell towers. So we're talking about data collected over a lot of people, over you know, a lot of different circumstances. So um, what we're gonna do here is, uh, what else do you need to know? I will be noting that this study found lots of examples of cancers. Mm -hmm. And notice here that the, the level, the largest power density measurement that they made during this entire study was 5% of the FCC limit. And that's to be noted. So let's look at the data. This is very convincing. So what we have on this red line are people uh, participating in the study. So these are for people participating in the study. And we're looking at the cancer mortality rate during the study. So the rate, the number of deaths per 10,000 individuals. The blue line is the cancer rate for the population in general. And so what you see is that as you get closer, as you live closer and closer to a cell tower, your incidence of death by cancer increases. And what's encouraging to note and reassuring to note is as you get farther and farther away, the cancer rate for the people in the study asymptotes to the cancer rate for the population in general, which it would have to. If it didn't, it wouldn't be a valid study. Also, you can see that you have this monotonic relationship, this dose-dependent relationship. In other words, you're not seeing a funky graph. You're seeing that the stronger you are, the closer you are to a cell tower, the greater the incidence of cancer. And so this is one of the studies that the, the, FC, the, the New Hampshire Commission looked at that said, wow, you don't want to be living here, but where is a reasonable distance to live from a cell tower? Well, you can see that there is a slight change in slope right here. Your cancer risks is not the same as the population in general when you're 500 meters from a cell tower, but it is significantly lower. <clears throat> I don't know how many of you that makes comfortable, but it is something to, to consider. Actually, uh, one guy uh, showed this to, uh, he was about to buy a house that was about here with respect to a cell tower and he turned down the deal. I would, mm -hmm. because the information that you're learning is going to get out and what's going to happen to property values for houses. I mean, in fact, I know the answer. Can you call on me? I know the answer. You know, in Pittsfield, the, the Massachusetts, where they put in the cell tower, the housing prices near the tower plummeted. So just to be aware that these cell towers not only risk your health, but they also have a profound impact on property values. So this is just part of, I could give, I have an entire presentation that I, where I show different ways to come to the same conclusion, and that is getting an offset, being 500, at least 500 meters away from a cell tower is probably a very good idea. Yes. No, no, please do. I wonder if there's any studies done with those small little boxes now that they're putting up in my town. So the, the conclusions, uh, I, I, I just looked at the epidemiology here, where you look at people's health living near a cell tower. There's a lot of other studies that have been done in the laboratory that look at, they expose animals, and in some cases be people to, or, or 
<laughs> products from people and they expose it to different levels of radiation and they come to conclusions about what's safe. So yes, they've done the studies and they're finding that yes, the same types of conclusions that I'm presenting to you now apply to the higher frequencies, the 5G higher frequencies. But remember, 5G isn't necessarily the higher frequencies. Some companies are using the same 3 and 4G frequencies for what they call 5G. But yes, the information is known and it is roughly the same. It doesn't, the, the problems don't magically disappear when you go to 5G at all. Hmm. But with those little boxes, is the power the same as? Well, they, they use beam forming antennas for those little boxes. And so if the antenna is not aimed at you, in other words, you're not using it, then no, the exposure is going to be less. But if you're using it, it is aimed at you. And in that case, your exposure is probably going to be better, uh, increased. But if you're around them, you're going to be having a greater exposure I in general. You know, because I've, I've heard people say that, oh, yeah, they're using beam forming so they can steer the energy away from you. And in some limited cases, that is true. But in general, not. Especially since they don't check them. No, but, uh, you know, they go up and there's no requirement that they have to go back and measure which direction we're going, unless your town puts it in. But that's well, a good point. And yeah, that is, and I think uh, if, if what I'm saying to you, know, my, my objective here is to just give you the general information, and then a next step for those of you who are concerned about impending uh, rollout in your town, th that would be an entire different meeting, and so, and you might want to get involved in that. <laughs> no, you are involved in that, excuse I me. <laughs> that. So rollout in a town, though, would be um, a communication company coming in to the town and saying we want to put 5G in. Yeah, the way the process works is they have to go through a permitting process. And sometimes that's transparent to people in the town, and sometimes it's not, from what I'm told. So you may not even know about it. And I've heard of cases where people all of a sudden, well, <laughs> they look out and there's a new tower installed. And so if, it, if it's been approved, though, by, you know, we have select board. That's right. So if it's approved, then it goes in. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So you'd be starting with the town select board. Mm -hmm. Planning board. Planning boards, too. Because sometimes it has to go through, yeah, a number of boards, which I think is a good idea. Mm -hmm. Educate the boards. Yeah. So just people have asked, you know, how does our standards compare internationally? I'm showing this at 6,000 uh, watts, or I'm sorry, 10, 6 watts per meter square, where in fact it actually goes up for most frequencies to a much higher value. You can see that other countries, many other countries, do have substantially lower standards. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No. Oh, okay. So, uh, peer-reviewed literature, I said I'm going to try to make this as painless as possible, but one of the first things I did when I was uh, appointed to the commission was I started reading. Peer-reviewed, I'm not sure how many of you are really familiar with what it means to be peer-reviewed. I've had a lot of questions about it. But basically, you find people with an expertise in a particular area. Uh, they, you know, for example, cell phone radiation, they'll write an article and then they'll submit it to a journal. Now, those journals, there are good journals and there are not so good journals. And one of my jobs on the commission was to, if I could just put this here, was to evaluate the journals where we obtained our information about the dangers of cell phone radiation. And one reason I could do that is I have served as an associate editor for the Institute for Electrical and Electronics Engineering. Some of you may be familiar with it. So for IEEE transactions on antennas and propagation, I spent time as an associate editor where I would get review or papers to be reviewed. I would send them out to reviewers. I would get back the re information from the reviewers and then make decision about whether or not a paper should be published or not. It's a very rigorous process. I won't go into much more detail than that. But I will say that the articles that we looked at, the articles from which we drew our conclusions were all from quality journals where the reviewers, the editors, and the people who wrote the articles were from main brand prestigious universities where they couldn't get away with publishing trash. And it's because that's one of the accusations from people in the cell comm industry, and that is we're looking at fringe journals, we're doing cherry picking, and I'll address the issue of cherry picking in just a moment. 
but I, I'm going to now run you through just some of the articles. Please try to stay awake. <laughs> and what I'm going to show you here, I'm going to give you the name of the article, and I'll give you the conclusions from the article. I'll give you a link to that article so you can make your own decision. I cherry-picked only in the sense that I'm trying to show you a range of risks associated with cell phone exposure from a range of researchers, from a range of universities, in a range of journals. So I just want to show you that this is not just one journal saying, well, we're going to target 5G and bring it down. No, that's not the case. These are researchers from around the world, from respected institutions, who have come to conclusions about cell phone radiation, and I'll just run through it quickly. So again, I give you the article title, you can click on this, you go to that article, and then the author's right here. And this is one that finds that you get exposure, brings about, and this is something that shows up a lot, oxidative stress, inflammatory response in rat brains. So these are low levels of exposure, such as what you get from a cell phone. By the way, I'm going to make all these articles, uh, the, this is all uh, available to you, um, and so you can just link to it and click on it. Yes? Is it list which journal is it? Uh, yeah. And this is uh, Neurotoxology 2015, so I give you all the excess information. So you can check it out, and you know, is that, this a fringe journal? And the answer is no, it's not. It, uh, how it, uh, oh, the oxidative stress is what creates free radicals, and most of us know that free radicals are not a good thing. So, rat brains, this next one, uh, multifocal breast cancer. This is something a lot of women put their uh, <laughs> cell phones <laughs> in their bra. And what this one, this is a case study, and it showed that the uh, tumors formed directly under where the antennas were located on the women's breasts. Don't do that. Don't put it in your body. And men, we put our, uh, our uh, turned on cell phones in our pockets. You can guess what we're exposing there, but that's on that slide coming up. <laughs> Uh, skin fibroblasts, that's what the, the matrix that makes more skin. And so the cell phone radiation affects that. And again, I'm just showing you a range of things, not just one thing that's affected by cell phone radiation. Uh, this is an important one. This is by Martin Paul. So he did, you know, a, a rigorous studies in the laboratory with people. And one of the things he found is that among the more commonly reported changes are sleep disturbances, insomnia, headache, depression, depressive syndrome. So this is not something that's just reported anecdotally by the firefighters as an example, but it also shows up in a laboratory setting. You take people, you expose them to electromagnetic fields. For a lot of them, this shows up. Now, some people are more sensitive to, to, uh, to this than others, just like some people are more sensitive to sun exposure. My wife can go out for three hours in the sun, nothing happens, I go out for 15 minutes and I get burned. It's similar, or appears to be similar, for response to radiation, for uh, this type of radiation. Some people are more sensitive to, than others. Another one, uh, radiation in male fertility. If you take two, two test tubes with semen, the same semen, you expose one to your cell phone, put the other one where it's not exposed, there's a profound difference in morphology, sperm count, motility. So a profound difference. It does impact sperm. So uh, you've also probably seen or read about the decline in sperm count in this country in the last 20 years or so. Again, I'll ask, where do we, a lot of us keep our cell phones? Because also laptop computers. Oh man, they don't. You know, they don't call them. They don't call them laptops anymore. Yeah. They don't want you to put them on your laps. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, can I, I think how many years I did that. Fortunately, I have three kids. <laughs> yeah. I'm not worried about that anymore. So you can read about this. Um, ah, right. So this is. They had two schools, and one school was closer to a cell tower and had five times the ambient radiation than the other school. And they did regular blood draws on these students, and they found a statistically significant difference in the blood sugars. And what they found was that the school near the tower with the higher radiation had what looked like precursors to type 2 diabetes, elevated blood sugars. So we know what's going on. You know, we were having an epidemic of type 2 diabetes, and this, I'm not saying this is the cause, but this is certainly suggestive of something. Um, oh, so not only your humans are vulnerable, vegetation is too. And so they've found, they've done a number of studies where they've looked at the cell towers, uh, the radiation on trees. 
And what happens is this tree starts degrading on the side exposed to the radiation, and of course then the degradation goes around the tree. And it's, so it's not only trees, but it's other forms of vegetation. Light. Light. Why, what? Life. Life, yeah, yeah, Tra other forms of life. So this is the other one. Now we know that insecticides are killing off our bee populations, but what you may not know is that radiation by itself will do the same thing. And so the combination of radiation and insecticides are having a huge negative impact. So this has been studied, I have lots and lots, I have many more articles on everything that I'm telling you about if you want to delve into it more deeply. So now is the time, I just gave you that smattering, that cherry picking, if you will, but I'm gonna address that head on right now. Uh, do, do all the published studies show the same thing? Show the same amount of harm, degree of harm, and the answer is, well, depends to a great deal on who funded the study. <laughs> now, surprise, surprise. surprise, surprise. Uh, I, I've looked recently uh, back at the, the history of, of smoking. And if you look at some of the early studies of smoking, right, it doesn't cause cancer. Yeah. In fact, I don't know if you know this, but five out of six people who smoke don't get lung cancer. So have we proven that it causes it? As recently as 1998, we had a, the uh, tobacco industry came out and said it, it never has been proven to cause cancer. <laughs> so we see that type of thing. And also we saw that with the tobacco industry, with uh, industry-funded studies with tobacco, uh, they found no problem. But when then you looked at non-industry-funded studies, well, they did. So we're finding something similar. So we're gonna go back to 2010 here, and here's something interesting. But back then, only 28% of industry-funded studies showed an impact, showed a negative impact of, for cell phone radiation exposure. But if you go to the non-industry-funded studies, 66% of them found a biological effect. And that's not all that dissimilar from what they were seen early on in the studies of cancer and smoking. But now let's go forward 10 years same guy who was doing the study, and you can report and read this. In that case, 73% of all studies, and this is you know, fairly recently, found a, a, a problem with neurological RFR, or that's radio frequency radiation. So 73% of the studies are finding a problem. Uh, for not so much for genetic effects, only 65% of all studies are showing a genetic effect, but fully 91% of studies are now showing a problem with free radicals or oxidative damage and from exposure to electromagnetic fields. So some people are calling you saying that we have ionizing radiation, that's above ultraviolet, but they're calling this oxidative radiation. It hurts you, it, uh, it affects you in a different way than the higher frequency radiation, but it definitely has an impact on your health. So let's go to some of the political and fiscal drivers. I already talked about how much money is involved in you know, having the standards where they are, how much can be saved. So the question that came to us early on in the commission was, what's going on with the FCC? Federal Communications, their job is to set limits that are safe, yet what we're seeing from the experts, what we're reading about in the peer-reviewed journals is it is not safe, the limits really aren't. And as I said, there are thousands of uh, peer-reviewed docu uh, publications documenting the harm. Uh, many other countries have lower uh, thresholds. The FCC standards were set in the 1990s, 1996 about, and a lot's changed since then, yet the rules haven't changed. And w so w w these are questions we had, and so we, the state, a state commission, you know, brought into uh, through, through through legislation signed by the governor we thought we'd have some power with the FCC we invited them to come in and answer some of these questions and nothing happened we didn't hear they didn't come so sent them emails yeah they they said well look at our website we looked at the website it didn't as answer our questions so that was uh, uh, the point we reached early on in this study right here this report, and I recommend that if you don't read anything else from what I'm saying, you might want to look at this one right here. It's easy to find. Uh, you could simply Google Harvard, FCC, and Captured. And it talks about something that may sound like a conspiracy, and when I first read it, I was thinking, maybe this is a conspiracy, but it, it's not. So, first of all, the title, how the uh, Federal Communications Commission is dominated by the industries it presumably regulates. 
what happens. And this report spells it out in great detail about how people from the telecommunications industry go to become the head of the FCC and they rotate around. This uh, quote right here, the industry controls the FCC through a soup to nuts uh, stranglehold that extends from its well-placed campaign spending in Congress through its control of the FCC's congressional oversight committees to its persistent agency lobbying. You read this and you see, oh, well, of course they're not going to change their limits. There's too much money involved and they are dominated by industry. So there, they, the Harvard report, the same report that I just referenced on the previous slide, goes into detail and it shows how they're using a playbook similar to the one used by Big Tobacco. You got to bring in a lot of money. So what do they spend uh, lobbying? $81 million, they have over 500 lobbyists. Uh, and they spend on campaign contributions, $32 million. That's not insignificant. So that is the playbook that they're using that is becoming all too familiar especially to those of us who have seen it play out with trans fats, with uh, asbestos, with PCBs, you name it. Industry does something similar. Industry is making lots and lots of money and they want to keep things the way they are for as long as they can. Um, I don't need to go into this. I do want to mention one thing, you know, because some people just say, well, how, what, what, what is that willing, the industry willing to do? Well, one thing they're willing to, to do is keep these thresholds these standards for radiation so high that they're causing significant harm. And, and they don't want you to know about it, as I've mentioned also. So here's a case, I'll just go through it pretty quickly. But the CTIA, remember that's the Cellular Techn uh, Telecommunications Industry Association, they sued Berkeley, California, because Berkeley wanted to put down this ordinance. The ordinance is, uh, the, and the reason this, the town council, uh, city council did that in Berkeley is because people weren't aware of the risks of exposure to the, these things. And so they wanted to make a simple statement, this statement right here, and have the retailers for cell phones hand this out every time they sell a cell phone. By the way, I should note that this information is already in your phone. You have to dig for it, but it's there. And basically what it says is if your phone's turned on, don't put it on you. Don't have it next to you. That's all it says. But the CTIA, the cell phone industry, felt that that would cause people to be concerned about their phones so they couldn't allow this to happen. And so they sued the town of Berkeley and the city of Berkeley. And they have so much money that it's a drop in the bucket to them. But it, what it does is it intimidates cities because cities can't afford that type of uh, legal things. Legal affair. The bottom line is, though, is they won. And the reason I'm raising this is to show, first of all, what uh, measures they will go to to keep you from realizing that your cell phone can be harmful to you. And also, that by the fact they won, the political power that they wield. So I feel like, you know, I mentioned on an earlier slide, this is not a technical issue, not a scientific issue, it is a political one. And these are the, po the, the, the realities of that politics. Now, the good news, and I'm not going to go into this very long, is that they were sued by the Environmental Health Trust. And back in uh, August 13th, they won the case. And what that means is that the FCC has now been told that they have to reevaluate their standards for radiation. It's clearly it's wrong. They've been able to put it off with all these years for all these years with political pressure and the political powers they wield. But now, because you know, people were just persistent, they have made a change here. And so you can read about the lawsuit. We still don't know what the ramifications will be and what the fallout will be. But it is giving people a, a little bit of traction uh, illegally to stop the rollout of, t of towers. In, in their cities. So be aware that there had, was a successful suit against the FCC. We don't know exactly what it means yet, but it means something. So a place to leave you is just what can you do to protect yourself? Keep your phones in airplane mode, please. And uh, <laughs> be careful where you put it. Um, use hands-free devices. It'd be better to use a you know Bluetooth, although Bluetooth is a radiator also. It's about 100 milliwatts. Uh, I don't like these wireless earbuds because they're right next to you. And there's this one over R squared relationship that was mentioned earlier. Uh, it's, use a wired headset. Great quality. Amazing quality, actually. Thank you, sir. <laughs> so uh, use a wired headset. And, and at home, if you can, wire it up. 
Yeah, yeah if, if, a lot of homes are already wired. Like I say, we had our home wired initially for for Ethernet, and then we went wireless later. But now going back to wired was pretty easy. So do that, and uh, much faster and much more secure. And see about getting your schools. Kids are really vulnerable to the radiation, and they're. There are some studies suggesting that some of the disciplinary issues that happen at school are as a result of kids' response to cell phone radiation. I see people nodding their heads, and I, I've certainly seen that my, myself. So ask your schools to get wired, and this isn't something you have to do overnight, but just as you evolve, or as you, you know, you, certain systems wear out, in other words, your wired, uh, wireless systems wear out, go back to wired. Many schools, if not most schools, already have the infrastructure in place to do it at relatively low cost. And then uh, work with your town administrators just to keep them informed of what's going on so that they're not taking off guard also because these cell providers, from what I understand, they come in gangbusters with lots of money and they wine and dine the town administrators. And so before the town administrators know what's going on, they've, already, they've agreed to put in towers. So, yeah, did you have a... I don't think it's really they wine and dine them, it's they threaten them. Because they have the FCC and the power of, you know, what the FCC regs say. Mm -hmm. And so they threaten the town and say, you can't do, you know, you can't fight us on this. The FCC says so. But there are things the towns can do, but they don't... Again, mm -hmm. you've, you've done it in New York, so... We're working on it. <laughs> so that ends the formal part of my presentation, if I could put it that way, and I'd like to open it up to questions and discussion. Yes? Um, I am very sensitive, and so I wear a solar line clothes. I have sleep in this, like a Faraday mosquito mat over my bed, and a silver lining under my bed, and I'm considering going to uh, silver line paint, which is extremely Oh, that's expensive, yeah. Oh, right, and, and it's going to come in the windows. Yeah, that's, by the way, that's something that I've done in, in, my in my professional career is create Faraday shields and create shielding called electromagnetic compatibility. And you're absolutely right that if you have seams, those seams can sometimes get currents on them that make the radiation worse. So. Uh, a couple of things to say to you in particular. One is, are you working with your physician to get labeled as, you know, electrosensitive? <laughs> diagnosed. Thank you, labeled. <laughs> I'm an engineer. Give me a break. <laughs> have you been diagnosed? Um, I have, but that doctor uh, died under mysterious circumstances. Um, so yeah. I'm not going to say that. You know, that's a, f a starting point because you have some right, no, you have rights under ADA, which recognizes electrosensitivity, but you have to have it diagnosed. Uh, and in Medicare, too. So if I were you or anybody who thinks you're electrosensitive, get it diagnosed formally. And there are things that can be done. There are mylar coatings um, that you can use that are less expensive than the silver, because you don't need silver necessarily. And then. Yes, mylar. It's, it's kind of like the, for the balloons. It's conductive enough. You can get e-glass that keeps the radiation from coming in. But get diagnosed first and then get a good meter or arrange for your library to purchase one that you can use. Because you, you might hop under your, your conducting mosquito net and find out that you're getting much greater radiation. But I would definitely do that. It mm -hmm. was all telecom presenters. There was nobody from the other side there. And what the telecom, what they said was, well, in rural areas, we don't want to do wireless. Of course, the place where there's not a lot of houses and people, where you could put a huge antenna up and go far, they didn't want to, they don't, they, that's not financially viable. There's not enough customers there. They want to put their towers in the middle of neighborhoods, and they said it right in that meeting, that that's their focus, where we want their towers out there, they want them in, because, like you say, they get the best coverage for the most people, and they don't care about the radiation. Right. And, and 
GPS, they, they kicked me off the Zoom that I was on because I typed too many things in the chat. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> wow, all right. <laughs> Respect. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes it is. So one thing is, oh. is somebody else? Uh, I think you were next and then sir I'll get you next. One thing you didn't uh, speak on is um, using cell phone on your ear and can it cause a brain tumor or any, I mean isn't that a cancer that is also been studied? Yeah it is. Now one thing you should know about glioblastomas is there's a significant latency period before when you start using it and start getting exposed to whatever is going to give you cancer and when it actually manifests itself. So for a glioblastoma, it can go from 10 years to 40 years. And so some of the physicians I've talked with are concerned that we're going to see a rash of these glioblastomas in about 10 years okay. because so many people are using them. Now to answer your question, if you're you're, I mean, we all do this. Getting your phone call, you're in a place where you need to hear. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, go ahead and do it. Obviously, it could be important. It would be great if you have your wired, wired headset. But if you can't, do it like this. I encourage you to use your phone like this. One reason is that your phone's not going to be working as hard because your antennas are usually about here, or on this one, I think they are. And so if you are wrapped, your hands wrapped around it, the cell phone radiation has to go through your hand. So it's going to turn up the power. By the way, the way that works is this usually has two powers. For the lower power is like 600 milliwatts and the upper level, upper power is three watts. So as soon as you put your hand around it, it's going to try to radiate stronger and so you're going to increase your exposure. So in general, use your wired headset if you have one. If you want to make a, you, a small, uh, shorter phone call, do it like this if you can. If you need to do it like this because it's loud, do it, but limit your time. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's all I know yeah. to say. Sir? Just like, given the title of this is 5G and a lot of stuff out there is 5G, is 5G in of itself more harmful, the radiation and the effects of it? Than 4G. So the only answer I can give right now, based upon the information that's known, is that the problem with 5G is that you're putting in another radiation source. So one way to look at the effects of exposure to radiation is it's like a, it's called electrosmog, and you can think of it like smoking. So if you smoke yourself, that's the worst, and that's like using your cell phone a lot. That's your strongest source of radiation. If you have a, other people who have their cell phones on in your presence or a cell tower nearby, or actually the other people with the cell phones, that's going to like, be like having secondhand smokers. So it increases the overall pollution that you're exposed to and makes you more sensitive. If you have a, a cell tower near you, that's going to be on 24-7, so it's like having a chain smoker living with you 24-7 and, and awake. It just raises the level of exposure. So just like smoking, the greater the pollution levels, the greater its going to, impact it's going to have. Now relating this to your question, what about 5G? 5G just means you're turning on another radiation source, so you're now going to raise that level. One of the concerns about electrohypersensitivity is that the more you're exposed, the more sensitive you become to it. So there are people, probably some of you, maybe me, that as that level increases, there's a point at which, a tipping point, where you start reacting and getting some of the symptoms that were indicated here on my, some of my earlier slides. So is it worse? I don't know at this point. I know it's different and I can give you some of the technical detail, but in terms of the epidemiology, I can't say at this point that it's worse, but it does add to what's already there and that is bad. Uh, because of the way it delivers, well, okay. Right? Well, but remember, not all companies are doing that. Uh -huh. Some companies, are, you know, because if companies are f have their own leeway in how they want to implement 5G. So some of them are choosing to go to the higher frequencies and have the steered antennas. So that's different. But some of them are, are maintaining the same 4G frequencies, and they're not using and they're using the not as directional, not the steerable antennas. 
So there are a lot of different things uh, that need to be taken into account here, and I can't just say 5G is worse. And I can't even say that necessarily going to the higher frequencies is a bad thing. And I can't say that having steered beams is a bad thing. But what I can say is that when you turn on that 5G, you're raising your overall exposure to this pollution. And that is not a good thing. Yes? Okay. Um, what I'll say is on the one slide that I had the name Cecilia Doucette, contact Cece. I'm in the market for a new meter myself, and that's one reason I'm a little bit shy about answering. Mine uh, didn't have the sensitivity. I did some tests on it, and oh my gosh, I, I bought the wrong meter. So I'm not going to tell you. But Cece knows, and she'll put you in, in touch probably with Magda Havis who is somebody from, uh, uh, is a faculty member from Canada, and she's doing a study in cities to, to look at uh, radiation exposure at, in different cities and different locations. And she's looking for volunteers, and you can get a discount on the meter if you'll go make measurements for her. And you probably want to do that anyhow. My understanding is that the meter is in a $300 range, a little bit pricey, but I, I'm going to get one because I think Anybody that's concerned about radiation should have one. And loan it to your friends and neighbors. Loan it to your local library. <laughs> you don't have one, do you? What was that? Uh, oh, a meter that measures electromagnetic field exposure? It's not electromagnetic. It's oh. just uh, <laughs> it's like your electricity usage meter. All right. We do have to wrap up. Oh, okay. Uh, do we have time for another question? Um, maybe one more, but then is there another way they can reach you if they have more questions? There certainly is. My name's there, and just Google me, and I show up. And how do we access the slides? Uh, so we will have that on our website, so we'll probably share it. I don't know what it is. <laughs> um, probably next week we'll have it up. Okay, yeah. okay so all the slides and all the hyperlinks are active. Did you? I just wanted to say there's a, supposed to be a documentary, Generation Zapped. I don't know. I haven't seen the do documentary, but I, I did Google it, and there was a two-minute trailer. And let me tell you, if you want to do a conversation starter with friends and family, just watch the two, two-and-a-half-minute trailer. Good advice. <laughs> it's quick and... Yeah, actually, before we leave, there's the gentleman back. You've been asking questions that indicate a slant that's different than mine. You had your hand up, so... Uh, the question I would have for you, then, is what is your... What, what do you consider the mechanism that's doing all this harm to you? Uh, this uh, stuff is low energy density. Uh, at 500 meters, it's like a tenth of a milliwatt per meter squared. Uh, it's of a frequency that ensures that it's up between one ten thousand and one hundred thousand of the energy per photon. So just visible light that doesn't do all this stuff to it. So um, what, what's, the, what's the physical mechanism that's causing the harm? Because you just said it's got nothing. You, for my, the, what, what I know of electromagnetism, okay, uh, the only thing that this could be doing is warming. Well, actually, you said it's so right. The magic that, that so actually, I, let me. It's just, uh, guys have two minutes. Mm -hmm. Well, the w the main thing that's being looked at right now is called the voltage gate calcium channel, and you're aware that we are very much electrical beings. So the way your body works, and you know, like to make nerve impulses, is that you have channels that open up in your cell and your tissues that allow ions through. And when you let enough ions through, it builds a big, a big enough voltage that can trigger uh, like a nerve response. And so what happens is when you have these fairly large electric fields, it causes that channel, the flow through that channel to be disrupted. So you can look at it as a voltage phenomenon that affects the voltage gate cal calcium channel. You know, give Google it. It'll give you some good information. So that's one way to do it. Another thing to uh, look at, and that is there are thermal effects. That cells have very short time constants. So if I have cells sitting here, remember they're not like clustered all together. You have cells that are fairly ap far apart in some cases. That they have a temperature response, time constant of one nanosecond.
that's time for pulsed radiation to cause warming in certain parts of the cell. So it's the nature, the impulsive nature of digital transmission that causes the type of response that's being seen. So those are what are there right now, and I can drown you in technical papers that I can't understand because I'm not a, a biologist, uh, or a, macro, a microbiologist, but I have been reading them and they sound pretty convincing so far. So if you like, I can share some of that with you. But, well, I think there is, but the, you know, the epidemiology supports. Well, that's right, and that's where you make the next moves in physics is by looking beyond what you think you know already. Thank you for your question, and thank you for your participation. <laughs>